Welcome everyone to the CDO Tech Fent. We are glad to have you with us. CDO Tech Fents are mini virtual events designed to give data leaders like you a compact way to learn about emerging technologies and products in our field. Our topic today is a good one, data observability, managing data quality and data pipelines in the cloud era. Our topic has been percolating for a year or two, and we thought it was time to bring it into the mainstream with a dedicated event. Future CDO tech events will cover things like data sharing and data marketplaces, data fabric and data mesh, and decision intelligence, among other things. By the way, my name is Wayne Eckerson, and I'll be your guide and host today. Also, I'd like to introduce you to our partners without whom this event would be possible. Our gold partners are Big Eye, Data Band, First Eigen, Unravel, and our silver partner is Excel Data. I'd also like to thank our media partners who help promote the event, uh, Blur Group, Data Nami, Solutions Review, HPC Wire, CD Insights, Bark, and RT Insights. Thank you one and all. And of course, a little bit about us, Eckerson Group, if you don't know already, is a research consulting and advisory company that specializes in data and analytics. Our consulting division has worked with many companies, big and small, brand name and not. We've helped them do a lot of different things, create enterprise data strategies, design modern data architectures, implement and optimize data governance programs, create cost-effective operating models, and develop self-service strategies that work, among other things. So contact us if you'd like to learn more. So first question for all of you in the audience, are you considering or using a data observability product? Check all that apply. And the answers are improved data quality, improved data pipeline performance, supplement data quality rules, find and fix issues before they reach customers, and other. So we see these uh, results coming in in real time, which is awesome. And it looks like find and fix issues before they reach customers is a little bit out in the lead. <laughs> outpacing data quality and improved data pipeline performance by a little bit, showing that is supplement data quality rules and others. So uh, that's terrific. So let's close this poll and uh, let's go to the next one, Sarah. Uh, hopefully you can all see this. The question is, where are you in the process of considering a data observability product? All right, answers are coming in fast and furious. Researching options, defining requirements, look like the top two researching options way out in the head. Other choices are evaluating products, implementing, maintaining, none of the above. So uh, some people are here just to uh, see what's going on, obviously. Looks like at least the majority here are attending for good reason to research their options, define requirements. So excellent. So I think that provides great context for our keynoters and our vendor panelists uh, in the next two sessions. So let's close this out and we'll keep moving on. Yes, now we are to the uh, featured event and our speakers today, as I mentioned, are Kevin Petrie, VP of Research at Eckerson Group and Laura Sebastian Coleman, Director of Data Quality at Prudential Financial. So Kevin, it is all yours. Thank you, Wayne. Folks, really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And um, I think we've got a great discussion here. It looks like we're hitting you at the right time. You're joining as you're doing some research on this emerging segment. What's interesting about this emerging segment is that it's repurposing, adapting tools that have been around for a long time, methodologies that have been around for a long time to address a problem that's been around as long as data, which is data quality and timely data delivery. So this is a very cool dynamic segment and really excited to, to dig in. It's also interesting to see the poll results that a lot of folks are most interested in resolving issues, fixing issues before they reach customers. And it's an interesting commentary on where we are with digital transformation right now. So many enterprises are engaging customers through digital platforms and there are so many ways in which that becomes a real-time interaction. You need to have accurate, timely interactions with customers. And it's absolutely critical to be very proactive to address data observability issues that come up. So 
great context here. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about the, actually, if we could go back, Wayne, real quick, the, the pressure of modern data delivery. As we know, there's an explosion in supply of data, the volume, the variety, the velocity, the users, the, the number of devices is exploding, as are the number of data types. And so you've got this wedge where data teams are trying to figure out how to run effective and efficient data pipelines between supply and demand. Those pipelines are getting broken. It can result in bad data and budget overruns uh, because there's so many moving parts. There are business changing business needs, changing endpoints, sources, and targets. Data structures are evolving. You can have errors that proliferate. And so enterprise IT teams, data teams in particular, are really struggling to deliver timely and accurate data to the business. So we can go to the next slide. And so data observability aims to help. Um, the discipline of data observability is to involves methodologies, people, process, and tools that study the health of enterprise data environments. It looks at data quality and data pipeline performance and applies machine learning and other advanced anomaly detection and other advanced types of algorithms to familiar methodologies for data quality and pipeline monitoring. Uh, it helps optimize data delivery across distributed architectures for analytics and for operational workloads. Laura and I were talking as we were building material for this and I talked about data-driven applications and she posed the question, aren't all applications data-driven now? And I think that's a great point. It's important to understand the degree to which reliable, accurate, real-time data is driving most operational workloads today. Data observability, I view in some ways as the monitoring foundation of data ops. We've done a lot of research on data ops, Wayne and others here. Uh, it has four pillars. They include monitoring. They also include testing of pipelines and data, CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment, and also orchestration. So data observability is gonna provide intelligent monitoring to enable effective data ops initiatives. Okay, this is part of a larger landscape. And our industry is great at enthusiasm, great at creativity, and great at pouncing on words and using them in different contexts. And so I think that there's a lot of justified excitement about innovation when it comes to observability, but I do want to clarify what we're talking about here is distinct from other types of observability. What makes it interesting is that these segments do converge and overlap, and we'll be talking about that. We see five disciplines of observability. In aggregate, they really do very similar things. We're monitoring signals, trying to extract signals from a lot of noise, generate alerts, correlating different events that are happening in IT environments, assessing root cause, and then remediating issues. That's the fundamental process that's being applied in all these disciplines. The observability disciplines that we see are include business, which is looking at business metrics and their trends, correlations and anomalies between those KPIs and their metrics. It also includes model observability, most often machine learning models, the performance, the accuracy and the compliance of those models, that gets critical as more and more AI and ML projects in particular get into production. Data observability, as I said, has two sub-disciplines, data quality, looking at the accuracy, the completeness, the consistency of data, and data pipeline, where you're looking at the performance of pipelines, which are effectively workflows that link data between a source and a target, the performance, the availability, and the cost of those pipelines, and also the infrastructure that supports them. Another important aspect of observability, another important discipline, which provides some of the uh, heritage methodologies to data observability is operations. So here we're talking about applications and infrastructure performance, availability, and utilization. You can look at this as a, a new version of APM, the new relics of the world, Dynatrace, and so forth, are addressing operations observability. So let's go to the next slide. There's a, a life cycle involved here. There are three stages. They apply to both data quality and data pipelines. The first stage is to validate and detect. So you wanna validate that the data is accurate, timely. You also wanna detect issues. So this involves looking at patterns, 
finding breaks in the patterns or anomalies, finding outlier values that are different from the median or the or mean. You also want to identify failures, components, pipelines, and so forth, and errors. It could be user issues that pr proliferate or user errors. It could be machine errors. Second stage here is to assess and predict. You need to triage issues, measure their impact on business, trace workflows, look at using traces, using logs and metrics and different tying those things together to understand the different chain of events that could be contributing to an issue and proliferating its damage. You want to correlate disparate events in your environment and then isolate root causes. That brings us to the third phase, third stage, which is to resolve issues and prevent future issues. We talked in the, in the start, your number one goal here is to prevent issues from affecting customers, and that involves fast resolution and proactive identification. So resolution can involve controlling issues, minimizing the damage, debugging pipeline code, optimizing, um, for example, by tuning different infrastructure that contributes to pipelines and cleansing data. So data observability seeks to fix issues and improve the uptime, your, the quality of the decisions that the business is making, and also improve cost. So let's go to the next slide. Let's dig in a little bit further. I won't spend too much time on this, but it's important to know what exactly are we monitoring here? What are we observing? When it comes to data quality, we're looking at two different types of elements, data at rest and data in flight. And you're going to learn about several different tools here that take different approaches and might have a focus on data at rest or a focus on data in flight. By observing metadata and samples of data, you're going to get a sense of the health of the data in flight or the data at rest by looking at primarily five different indicators. One is validation. Is a value correct? Is a set of values correct? Another is distribution. So you don't necessarily have all the time in the world to check every cell in a spreadsheet. What's the distribution of values? Is that different from what it was yesterday for an operational report? What's the volume of data that's coming in? If that volume spikes or changes without a valid business reason, then you might have some quality issues that need to be addressed. Another is looking at the schema of the data, the structure of it. And another is looking at lineage, its provenance, who's touched it and how's that address, um, how's that influence quality. When it comes to data pipelines, we're looking at different elements, the source, memory, clusters, and so forth that are contributing to data transfer, the landing zone, the target, and then the application that's consuming that data. And you want to understand through logs, traces, and metrics, the health of those pipeline elements. The indicators of that are going to be, is that element up or down? Does it have uptime? What's the latency, the throughput, uh, number of concurrent users supported, and so forth? So that's just a, sort of a high-level view of all the different signals, uh, all the elements involved. So let's go to the next slide. Great. So success factors here. One of the key points that Laura is going to dig into shortly is that tools there's a lot of enthusiasm about tools, as there should be. There are some pretty exciting ways in which anomaly detection, machine learning algorithms are helping advance the ball to adapt to this new world where you've got exploding cloud-driven, digital transformation-driven environments, a lot more to track. But you also need people in process. And so that's a, an underwriting, uh, overriding factor here when we look at the success factors. Organizations need to have a strategic plan. You need to have strategic objectives and oversight. So ideally, you'll have a data leader who's going to assemble a team, who's going to recruit a cross-functional set of individuals to build that data observability program. And so the team really involves data engineers. It's going to involve data stewards within the line of business who, as part of their, like they'll have a separate day job in a lot of cases, but they'll need to uh, enforce data quality rules. They'll need to uh, contribute to ongoing reviews and oversight of data flows. Another key element of the strategic plan is to identify control points. And these are control points both from all three elements. They're from an architecture, from a technology perspective. What are the points within your data pipelines that make, where does it make the most sense to check quality? Where, does it, where are their issues most likely to arrive? So what's the higher risk in order to prevent bottlenecks, in order to prevent issues that proliferate? Another control point is to look at people. Who are the people best equipped to 
monitor and handle these data observability tools. And then there's also process. What's the right workflow for these individuals to, or I should say work stream for these individuals to spot issues and collaborate cross-functionally with business owners to alert them and with members of AT team and the data team. Uh, so those are all the, the big three elements of the strategic plan that you need to have. The next is program design. It's critical for, say, the data engineer who's going to be leading this effort or the head of the data team who's going to be leading this data observability program. They need to design architecture. And that's not to say they're going to design ground up new pipelines and so forth. They need to figure out how they're going to fit into and adapt the existing architecture. They also need to select the right tools. We're here today to help you evaluate tools and select one, select the right one for your business. Um, and so we're going to be digging into that a fair amount. I think milestones is critical. Uh, we find that the most effective data observability programs are ambitious in scope, but incremental in approach. You want to have a finite, achievable, near-term milestones to gauge success, to demonstrate success to the business, to individual stakeholders, and then to implement on that and sort of execute on phase two, phase three, it's a good way to secure budget and demonstrate to executive sponsors that you can achieve this. The third key element here is program execution, implementing and integrating tools, monitoring KPIs. And by KPIs here, we mean, you know, for data flows, but also for program success. What's the rate of data errors that are influencing the business? And program execution, learning and adapting is critical. You need to respond to different levels of achievement as you go past different milestones. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, if organizations can achieve effective data observability programs, I believe that they can achieve uh, six different benefits here. Analytics value. If the business can extract more value from analytics, can drive more data-driven decisions, um, that's a clear ROI. It's not necessarily easy to measure, but there's, uh, I think, no question that uh, empowering organizations to consume data more effectively uh, and to base their business operations and decisions on timely and accurate business, timely and accurate data delivery, uh, they can respond to the needs of the, of the environment that they're in. So that leads to agility. Data uptime and reduced risk are also critical benefits that organizations need to achieve. I think there's no question that data is playing a higher role in enterprise operations and strategies, and organizations really need confidence that the data that they're consuming is accurate. Final two benefits here are efficiency and productivity. So with efficiency, we're talking about uh, reducing the need to resend data, reducing the bottlenecks, reducing the overages from a business perspective of how you consume infrastructure, and also making teams more productive business teams more productive, and data teams more productive as well. So a data observability program implemented, designed and implemented well, can really help capture the upside of data and reduce its downside. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Laura here and she's gonna provide some perspective from a practitioner point of view. Uh, Laura's written several books on this topic and I think we'll have a good perspective on what works. Sorry, Wayne, we go back quickly. But the key point with best practices is that you need to treat your data observability program as a living, adaptable contributor to your business. Look for incremental change rather than ripping and replacing processes or aspects of your architecture and define tool evaluation criteria. We're going to be providing some and digging into that align with your business objectives. So if you take an agile incremental a business-centered approach to data observability, you can increase the odds of success. So Laura, why don't I hand it over to you? You can introduce yourself and walk through your perspective here. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Um, thanks, Wayne and Kevin, for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. This topic, I think, is extremely important. I'm excited about what these new tools offer because I'm very committed trying to address <laughs> the challenges that many organizations face when they try to manage the quality of their data. As Kevin mentioned, I have uh, written several books. Uh, two of them are directly on data quality management. One came out in February, and then I was the production editor of the data management 
uh, Body of Knowledge, Dama's second edition of that. And I wrote a book uh, to follow up that called Navigating the Labyrinth, which is an executive guide to data management and kind of boils down the DMBOC uh, in ways that uh, for non-technical people and for people who don't have time to read 600 pages, uh, helps people understand uh, what data management writ large involves. So let's go to the next slide. So I wanna take some of the uh, remarks that Kevin has shared so far particularly about the fact that, you know, data quality problems have been around for a long time and that now they're coming faster and thicker and with more implications for organization. I want to take that as my starting point and talk a little bit about why it is challenging to manage the quality of data. And then I want to talk about how these tools fit in. So when I talk about data quality management, I, I like to use this idea of the five challenges. And we're all familiar with, the, with numbers two, three, and four, people, process, and technology. But sometimes we don't think about the other uh, sides of the shape. The first is data itself. The data is, as Tom Redmond calls it, slippery. It informs you about the business. It really ties your business together. But it does that because it's encoding meaning. And in encoding that meaning, you need people who can interpret it and use it to get value from it. And when we think about that, we realize that people work within a culture. And so the culture itself has to support the use of uh, the building of knowledge around data. And also it has to support the investment in actually understanding the data well enough to get that value from it. So we think about these five things, data, people, process, technology, and culture, and all of them should be working in sync with each other if an organization is going to get as much value as possible from its data. If, if the people in that organization are going to be able to use the data to meet organizational needs and to act on opportunities. So a lot of focus in many organizations is on the technology part, but if you don't have the people and processes to support that, then you don't get the value that you need. So when I started reading about these uh, data observability tools, and I, I really just learned this term about 18 or 24 months ago, and I, at first I thought, you know, is, how is that different? And when I looked into them, I could see that what I liked about them is they present this comprehensive view. They recognize that data quality is not just about the population of individual columns or the execution of business rules. It's really about how data moves through the organization and where it can get used. I also really like the fact that these tools are drawing not only on machine learning and artificial intelligence, those are the buzzwords, but they're using a lot of the principles of um, statistical process control. And I believe firmly in uh, those principles as ways of detecting anomalies and keeping a, a better eye on data than you can get from just looking at uh, rules. But the problem, as Kevin alluded to, is that the tools themselves aren't going to solve the problem. You really need people with skills and knowledge, and you have to plan for the success of these tools. And so some of the things that Kevin just mentioned about the success factors, having a strategy, having goals, those are really going to be most critical to success in getting value from these tools. So if you could go to the, the next uh, slide. So... I want to kind of flesh out a bit more about what that looks like. You need to know not only what the tools are and what they do, but in fact, people have to understand the data itself. And they have to understand the methodology behind the tools, what it means to detect anomalies, and what to do with issues when they emerge. So you have to have a plan to act on things. Now, some of the work of the tools will do cleanup and those kinds of things, but not everything can be resolved the first time. And if you want to teach the tools how, how to fix problems for you, then you need to be uh, teaching them. So you need to really think through how are we going to respond? What do we know about our data? What are the risks? And how can we make most of the information that the tools provide? Next slide. 
if you have really smart people and they know what they're doing and they understand the data, that is great, but they also need to be empowered to actually make those decisions. And that's where the culture question comes in. So organizations that really want to make the most of their data and get value from their data need to also trust their people and they need to, uh, they need to fund how that data will be improved. And that's why it's important as you adopt these tools and work with them that you have clear governance over how you will use the findings, who will make decisions, um, are you prepared if you find things in your data to actually make the changes that you need to improve the data. And that really comes down to establishing accountabilities, which is what you know governance aims at uh, writ large. Last two slides, and I'll, I'll talk to the, the next one. Uh, the last two are about applying uh, data quality uh, methodologies uh, to the use of these tools. And I'm going to focus on this one just for a few moments because it's a slide I've used for a long time that really talks about the risks associated with data and the concept of data as the product from a process. And as Kevin's slides pointed out, when we're talking about a data observability, we want to we talk about not only the content of the data, but also the steps through which data is delivered. This is a very simple diagram. It talks about the fact that things can go wrong at every step, but it also emphasizes the idea that, yes, you really do need to know not only your data content, but your pipeline. And you need to know it well enough so that you can then put controls in place. You can actually learn from uh, the things that have gone wrong with your pipeline and you can put controls in place at the right points uh, to prevent things from going wrong uh, particularly you know with the creation of data but also as you move data throughout the organization because one of the things that is very true about our current state is we not only have more data in different forms but we want to use it in so many different ways it's never going to all fit together right from the start, you have to do the work to bring it together and that work involves risk. So I think the foundational ideas around data quality management, managing data as a product, understanding your customers, your data consumers and their needs, those remain uh, in our current state of big data. The data observability tools provide the means through which we can actually act on those in, now that we have these larger volumes and more complicated uh, forms of data. So I'll leave it at that, Kevin. The next slide again, as I said, is just kind of a summary of various ways of thinking about data quality, but I'll hand back to you. Fantastic, thank you, Laura. Good, so hopefully we've provided you a, a rounded viewpoint of what the problem is, why data observability can help, uh, what the potential benefits are, and then the, the caveats about how to place the tool within the right program that also looks at people and process. So now what we want to do is roll up our sleeves and say, how can we help you pick the right tools? So let's go to the next slide here. The first important point is that the observability products are part of a larger ecosystem. Um, so I, I want to share the, the primary product segments that um, data observability needs to interact with in your environment and also potentially integrate with in terms of products or suites that you buy from vendors. There's data observability, which is, as we said, includes data quality and data pipeline observability. There's also this bucket uh, we'll call data management, which involves governance platforms, the focus of our prior event four months ago data catalogs, which can centralize a lot of the metadata, a lot of the indicators about data quality and timeliness of data delivery, as well as consumption of data. There are data fabrics, which become critical. Fabrics help you consume data, provide a semantic layer that brings together data from a lot of different platforms in order to help standardize how it's consumed. And then there are obviously their data pipeline tools. Uh, data pipelines are going to link, uh, extract, transform, and load data between sources and targets. And um, there are pipeline tools that include data observability checks now. 
there are also other observability segments. And um, as we've, we've talked about, and I've, I've written some articles about this, there are ways in which um, operations observability contributes methodologies and so forth to data observability. There are also tools that combine ML model observability with data observability. And there are tools that contribute to business observability based on data observability. So in some data observability needs to integrate with other ecosystem tools in your environment. Uh, some products are going to include data observability as a feature uh, within multimodal tools. So you need to treat data observability as part of a larger tool set for your data and your IT environment. The next slide. Okay, so we have four categories here that are gonna help you start to sort vendors and tools. And it's important to note that, as we talked about, there's a convergence, there's an evolution of capabilities. Um, and it's important to really drill into the tools that are gonna give you the depth you need, but also the breadth of capabilities. But with all that said, we've divided this on, on two axes. The first one is, is there a focus on data quality or data pipelines? Second is, is there a focus on having a pure pay solution or a multimodal solution? So let's start with pure play data quality focus uh, organizations. This is what's getting a lot of uh, focus right now. You should pick products in this category if you have acute data quality issues that you need to address and you really want to focus on that. Coming up, the multimodal data quality uh, approach is to pick products in this category if you want to address data quality observability as part of a larger tool, larger tool set focused on data governance, cataloging, or data fabric. Coming to the, the right-hand column here, the data pipeline pure play companies are really focused on data pipeline observability. And you should go to this segment if you're looking at addressing data pipeline performance, reliability, and cost. If we move up from there, multimodal data pipeline set is, is, is a set of products that you should pick if you're looking to address data pipeline observability as part of data pipeline design, deployment, and management. So let's go to the next slide. And this is how we see uh, vendors shaping up in these segments. And I want to make a few important notes here. Our, our sponsors who are going to be part of this, uh, that vendor panel that we're, that we're hosting shortly, uh, are, are here in, in bold. We're actually going to have um, Excel data. Uh, the guy will not be participating, but they will have a, uh, a breakout session afterwards. Um, so in the in pure play data quality segment, we've got First Eigen, which is providing some pretty deep capabilities in terms of customization to make sure that you can have the right dynamic checks of data quality. Uh, Big Eye is, is doing a lot in this space. And in the, the center segment, we've got Excel data, uh, which has built an, an approach to take a full stack approach to the delivery of data and some pretty robust data quality checks. Datamand recently was acquired by IBM. And so they have both data quality capabilities and data pipeline capabilities. They're now part of IBM, which creates very interesting possibilities in terms of integration uh, being used alongside other observability capabilities and also uh, data fabric solutions. So unravel data, critical capability here. And we actually have late breaking news, which we weren't able to put into this slide on time is that uh, Unravel data is moving to the center as well. So Unravel has sort of a multifaceted viewpoint on observability, helping optimize uh, timely, cost-effective data delivery. They're also building data quality checks in there. So they're moving to the center in a big way to also address data quality. And you'll learn more about that in the, uh, the panel and also the, the breakout session. So. Lots going on here. I think the key points on the top row I'd point out is that you've got um, a lot of these multimodal uh, suite oriented vendors that are addressing data observability as well. Uh, to take an example, Calibra and Matillion are, have catalogs, but they're also looking at observability and cataloging observability checks because that's a critical component of the data assets that you need to centralize metadata for. Uh, on the right hand side, with multimodal tools focused on data pipelines. DataOps.Live uh, has a pretty robust set of capabilities for data ops, looking at 
uh, pipeline testing, uh, data testing, looking at monitoring, which is really the observability piece, and then also looking at orchestration. Um, so there's a lot going on there, as well as CICD and uh, observability as a piece of that. Now, StreamSets is involved in data ops. They help you configure, set up pipelines, uh, and they're helping organizations meet a lot of different business requirements, and they're broadening what they're doing in observability to assist that. So lots going on here. One of the key things we're going to talk about with vendors on our panel shortly is how is this changing? What's your strategy? Uh, where are you moving? And uh, how would you say that uh, this chart, these categories will evolve over the next few years? Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, I want to look in particular at evaluation criteria. The challenges I think we've covered pretty well, which is you've got this explosion in data. Um, you've got this increasing real-time imperative driven by uh, digital interactions with customers in the wake of accelerated digital transformation. It was accelerated by COVID, as we all know. Um, organizations have alert fatigue. You can get granular views of all kinds of risks, but if, uh, if your data engineers are constantly monitoring alerts, they don't know how to filter the signal from the noise. So that's a big, a big issue. Uh, in complex environments. Organizations, I, I spent five years with Attunity, a data integration uh, vendor, and we had so many enterprises that wanted to consolidate data onto a single cloud platform, but the old stuff never kind of went away. And so these environments get more and more complex each year. You've got more and more sources and targets and um, heter increasingly heterogeneous environments, especially as organizations try to uh, analyze multi-structured data. Compliance is obviously a major consideration. Um, a lot of the legislation um, is getting uh, focused now. If you look at CCPA coming out of California, if you look at GDPR, which has been in place now for several years in Europe, really focus on demonstrating that you're only doing explicit actions that you've been explicitly granted uh, permission to do with customer data. So PII, personally identifiable information, is a big focus. With that context, let's look at a specific evaluation criteria. And this is where the rubber meets the road. I gave you a broad brush view of how to categorize products, but it really gets down to exactly what are your requirements and how does this particular tool or set of tools you're looking at provide the depth and the breadth of functionality. So breadth of functionality likely will mean, are you getting data pipeline performance as well as data quality? It might mean you also need model observability for your machine learning uh, projects. What's the breadth of that functionality? But also what's the depth? What are the specific ways in which you're getting customization and uh, views into data quality checks for your environment? Performance and scale is critical. As we know, enterprises always need to budget for a lot of growth here because the volume of data continues to grow. The usage of data continues to grow. The environments continue to get complex. You need to make sure that when workloads spike because of a success, excuse me, successful uh, digital initiative, you can support that. Ease of use uh, really gets to the alert fatigue, among other things, making sure that data engineers, data stewards, business owners can quickly understand what the issue is and quickly get to resolution. Open architecture is, is really important. Um, one of the key points we've been making is that data observability is part of a larger story. It's gonna have a lot of touch points in your environment and you need to make sure as you look at a tool, is it going to integrate with the right elements in your environment? Is it going to take a lot of manual coding um, and, and create a lot of work to achieve that level of integration? And governance, governance is critical. Um, there are two elements to this. One is at a basic level, are you making sure that only the right people are using your data observability product? Are they authenticated, authorized and so forth? And Perhaps more importantly, certainly more importantly, you need to make sure that what you're doing, the outputs of, the, of your data observability uh, tool are assisting, actively assisting governance programs so that you have the right reporting, the right alerts, and the right checks to make sure that uh, your full cross-functional team can demonstrate compliance uh, with various initiatives. So it's important to inspect and select products based on their ability to address modern enterprise challenges. Okay, so let's go to the next and final slide here. I wanna summarize before we start taking questions uh, by saying that it, it's important to select your product category based on what you have today in your environment. You need to start prioritizing your criteria by business needs. 
It's important to prioritize your criteria by business needs. If you're in a highly regulated environment, you need to make sure that you're really paying attention to the governance aspect. If you're in a fast moving environment where you could have a sale on Cyber Monday that doubles your business, you need to make sure that performance and scale is, is appropriately addressed. Um, if you evaluate your products with people and process in mind, you can make sure that what you ultimately buy and implement is going to assist with a successful multidimensional data observability program. So we recommend addressing and answering these strategic questions before evaluating products. Okay, so I think we have about five minutes now, maybe six minutes, and I wanted to uh, open up for questions. Um, Wayne, perhaps you've seen some come in. Yeah. Uh, one question, uh, what are the KPIs to use for understanding success of data observability tool adoption? Uh, that's from Irina. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Laura, Kevin, what do you think? I think that there's two stages in KPIs for adoption. Uh, first is actually the adoption part itself, right? Um, how much coverage do you have? Uh, how are you using the tool? How successfully are you using the tool? I mean, what percentage of your data that you plan to uh, observe with the tool are you actually observing with the tool? And then I think you need to think ahead to uh, how you're using the tool and the value that the tools will bring. So for, for traditional data quality uh, cost benefit, you, you would have to have good knowledge of the risks that you've uh, had problems with in the past and uh, how those risks manifest now that you have a new tool in place and can manage them better. So again, if I go back to the, the comment I made about having knowledge of your own data, uh, that is instrumental in setting up effective metrics because you really want to always be showing a kind of before and after uh, effect of this kind of tooling. I agree completely. And you might also add quickly that it's important to um, evaluate what, what it took to get to the desired level of adoption, how much training was required, how much disruption to existing process. Um, that helps you evaluate whether you got the ROI you were looking for, which will help with future decisions about supporting additional business units and so forth. Good question from Lori. Are ML models available to calculate business value impact of failure to adopt data observability management discipline? That might be a good question to ask our vendor panel, but I don't know, Kevin, Lori, do you have any uh, perspective on that? Yeah, if we had those models, I love the idea. If we had those models, I think it would be a lot easier to make business case for uh, various kinds of data quality improvement efforts that, you know, there's lots of ways of thinking about the impact of poor quality data on business processes and on outcomes, but I don't know that anybody's actually kind of put it into an algorithm. This prompts a lot of thought. <laughs> yeah, one more question. We have time for one more. Here's here's the one that's uh, more appropriate for the keynote. Uh, Hari, uh, is data observability to be tagged as a sub-practice under data governance? Any key metrics for the same? So I would argue that it, it should be part of a data governance multifaceted program. Part of that question gets to how your team and your enterprise is organized. Uh, so it might make sense to have a separate dedicated team. But I think regardless, there needs to be a, a lot of collaboration and a very much sharing of objectives and um, and KPIs there. Um, love to hear your thoughts, Laura, and especially on the key metrics. I think that um, we've we've talked about some of the metrics for tool adoption. You, you want to make sure that you're getting to the heart of to what degree you're enabling the business. So how many new users are you able to support? How many new initiatives are you able to support? And what are the business benefits they're generating um, thanks to your data observability program? Yeah. So I think. Your point about how you do governance depends on how your organization works anyway. Uh, I think that's important. And I tend to see everything through the lens of data quality, meaning the goal of, of data governance, the goal of data management, of data quality management, whatever title you give it, is to ensure that the organization has trusted, reliable data. 
And data observability is one more tool in the toolbox of ways that you can bring that about in the organization. So I wouldn't call it in a sense a separate thing. The, the tools have functions that help you achieve the goal of uh, ensuring the data is of high quality and can be trusted and used. And then if that takes place, uh, then the key metrics are really about how the business uses the data, you know, and are they able to do so efficiently? Are they able to do so effectively? Do they have to encounter a lot of obstacles or can they use the data with confidence, start new projects, start new initiatives, build new models, whatever uh, those activities are? If they have a straight path to that because they're confident in the data, they know the data, they understand the patterns in the data, then that's where you get the value. So it's really a lot of the KPIs from my point of view would be about the processes that are using the data and ensuring that those are able to become more efficient. Echo that. Uh, in our consulting division, we do a lot of data governance work and there are a lot of things to govern, right? Access management, architecture, security, privacy, but it's always data quality is probably the prime target for any data governance program. It's not the only, but it's certainly the prime one. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, now we're at the highlight of our event, the one we have the most fun with uh, each time we do it. Here we have four experts debate how to evaluate and select, in this case, a data observability platform. Now, each of our panelists are experts in the field. They all have a different perspective. So you're going to gain a really quick understanding. It's a really good use of your time of the key characteristics of data observability tools that you need to consider if you're going to buy a product in this space. So it's my honor to introduce our panelists. Uh, first, Josh Benaram, um, CEO of Databand. Uh, Seth Rao, CEO of First Eigen. Chris Santiago, VP of Solutions Engineering of Unravel. And Rohit Chowdhury, CEO of Excel Data. Welcome, gentlemen. Gentlemen, you ready? Let's dive in. So first question, let's just get right to the root of it. What factors should data leaders like the ones on this event who are listening right now, consider as they evaluate data observability product. Who wants to go first? Why don't you pick one, Wayne? Josh, why don't you go? So uh, the question being, what should data leaders consider as they evaluate different data observability products? I think um, the answer I would give to start on this domain and really any other domain is understanding what is the problem that you're facing and who are you solving it for? because the, the core issue is going to feel a little different in different teams, and that's going to point towards different solutions and different stakeholders might be a little different. So examples, what I mean there, if you're solving for a challenge of maintaining a data SLA of a data product that's being delivered to some end customer of yours, that might lean your evaluation criteria more towards ops-oriented solutions that really cater to data platform team that needs to manage the overall system. If your observability requirements, on the other hand, are more targeted towards analysts that are internally using data sets, that might point towards different kinds of considerations where a lot of those folks are more oriented towards understanding tables and the health of a data table rather than a full data pipeline. So the first consideration I'd always think about is what is the challenge that we're looking to solve and who is the team that feels that challenge most acutely and starting from there. Um, on the actual product level, there's considerations that I would take into account, like the type of metadata that's supported, the, the type of tools that you're integrating to and what you use to run your data stack, and what kind of alerts that a system like ours is distributing and who those get routed to and, and what is the content of those alerts to help find and, and remediate issues. Yeah, I want to add to what Josh was saying. I would preface it with three questions, what, where, and how. To, when you're evaluating data observability products, the question is, where do you want to observe? What do you want to observe? And how much do you want to automate? So the reason these three are important is because the vendors who provide the tools uh, line up differently depending on what the question is. So when you say where you want to observe, and if the answer is Snowflake, then there are 
quite a few vendors in that Snowflake space, in the data warehouse space. But if the answer is a data lake, then it's a different set. It's not the same group that does that. And if it's a pipeline, it's a different group as well. And the next question is, what is it that you want to observe? If the answer is, I am content uh, observing the metadata, then you have a different group of vendors. And if you want to observe the data itself, then you have a different group. And the third question is, you know, how much do you want to automate? That depending on that, your SMEs are going to have either more or less uh, workload on them. And the different vendors out in the marketplace have automated different pieces of observability. My suggestion is don't think about boiling the ocean, trying to get everything all in one product. You will just get an average product for all functions. It's good to have a lot of flexibility, thinking of tool, think of it as individual Lego blocks that will connect with other blocks in your ecosystem. So it's always good to have these individual Lego blocks that are very powerful, very capable and have very deep functionality in one space. Uh, so just Seth, one quick follow-up question. Does that mean companies are going to need to buy multiple data observability tools if each one's monitoring a different piece of the pie? I think the market is evolving. Each of the vendors here on this panel uh, have some done something very unique and specialized because the problem is a very broad problem. And if each of us tries to do everything, uh, it's going to be hard to have a world-class product in that one thing. Ultimately, the product will evolve. There will be some coalescence. But right now, my suggestion is if you have a very specific problem, ask how can I solve that very specific problem? Uh, if you want to try to boil the ocean, you'll end up saying, I just need you know, an Oracle or, or, or whatever else. So you'll have an average of everything, uh, not the best in one particular thing, in one particular thing. Great, thanks. Just to answer that, that question, Wayne, about different solutions, um, I actually know of customers that we have that use us and um, at least one other service of people on this call now. So in large organizations, I would definitely see different data observability solutions being leveraged, just like you would see different data, or rather general observability solutions being leveraged. You might see APM and cloud infrastructure observability and solutions. So there's enough diversity of need at, at the largest companies in the world that I think there's a good case to bring in multiple. Smaller companies, uh, mid-sized businesses, startups, I think that's where it starts to get a little tricky to justify and where you just want to pick a solution based on where the gravity of your needs are. You know, one thing I just wanted to add on this conversation, you know, all very valid points, you know, focusing in on the stack and, and trying to solve the, the problem. You know, one other angle, which I was also overlying too, is what about like the business itself, right? So business observability, somebody's funding this, right? So, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of business metrics, such as revenue, costs, transactions. You know, how are we going to track that? And more importantly, how are we going to measure that, right? So, you know, as we're deploying uh, new observability, you know, platforms out there, you know, what is the as is state? What's the 2D state? How are we tracking that? You know, so we can measure and actively say that this is actually bringing value. We're also seeing a lot of folks bringing in a lot of FinOps teams, right? Who are really there to really not only make sure that the pipelines are working correctly, but, you know, also just really a focus on making sure and governing, you know, where, where cost is going, controlling those cloud costs, seeing where the money is spending, who are the biggest vendors, so on and so forth. So that way we can identify opportunities to uh, optimize the environment and overall reduce costs if, if that's the, what people are going for. Yeah, I was at Gartner yesterday, you know, on their three day data analytics summit. And, and you know, I don't think there's like a bigger exhibition hall. So if you just think <laughs> of it, if you just step back and, and think of, you know, how many of those vendors will exist next year, or will we need like a bigger uh -huh. exhibition hall and will we need to, you know, split it into two. And if you just bring it back to, uh, let's say the SVP of platform engineering or a CDO today, just consider the kind of complexity that they are dealing with. They're buying data platforms and they're, you know, being pitched by every single vendor who was out there exhibiting. So I just took a step back yesterday and I said, thank God I don't run engineering and thank God I don't run data platform engineering anymore because, you know, it is so confusing out there. 
And I think, you know, one of the things that we need to recognize is that, you know, the, the purpose of observability is to actually simplify everything that data leaders have to do. And as long as we can keep our, you know, eye on that particular objective, I think, you know, the selections then become very easy. I think I partially agree with, you know, some of the comments made earlier. The way to think about, you know, a selection of a platform would, I would basically look at two things. One, what is it capable of today? And what is the roadmap and what is the capability that it will bring? And what are the use cases that it can support? Because, you know, observability can mean many different things. It just depends upon whether your data and analytics and machine learning and AI capability and maturity model fits the offering that the product provides you today. If you're like a small company, if you're a startup or an SMB and you know you have a data engineering team which is of 5, 10, 20 people, then I'm sure that many of the point solutions would work. But if you really think of you know large enterprises, the global 2000s, you know, they're dealing with a complexity which is much greater and much higher and they're probably a little more evolved in terms of their own thinking about the data and analytics space. They're not looking for an observability solution because they could not solve the problems that they got. They're looking for a solution because for them, it is prohibitively expensive to run the platform and to build the observability solution. So I think, you know, it depends upon who is the buyer and what challenge are they trying to solve and where they are in their own data journey. You know, most of our customers today, they're extremely, you know, large users of data. You know, they support multiple businesses you know, collect data from several different sources. And for them, you know, these problems are not entirely separate. You know, they look at it, the whole thing together, which is that, you know, pipelines are nothing but abstractions of business processes, you know, infrastructure failure slash cost results in poor quality of data. And, you know, the end objective is to get data into the right hand. So each of these objectives are like very closely tied together for most of the large customers who deal with, you know, petabytes of data at scale. Okay. Let me bring in a question from the audience that's, that's related here. Uh, she talks about how scalable, but she also says, well, who integrates all these tools if we're talking about, you know, multiple observability tools and integrating observability with uh, your platform? That, that's a tough one. You know, that is precisely the problem, you know, that you don't have enough data engineers to deal with your data problems today. And now you're asking, you know, the data leaders to, you know, invest in multiple data tools or observability tools. So instead of actually helping them solve the problem, you're actually handing them more problems. So I think, you know, to my earlier point, I think it's important that you buy one platform that does many of these things. You may implement it in different ways, you know, to what Seth was saying earlier. I think it's useful that where is your problem most acute today? But the answer to the acuteness of the problem cannot be found in, you know, a limited platform. So I would say, you know, one, preferably self-serve, something that actually, you know, gives all the problems away or at least solves it. So let me add to Rohit's comments. He's very right. The complexity is going to increase as you have more and more tools in your uh, ecosystem that you need to integrate. Now, that said, uh, there are a couple of ways to solve that complexity. Uh, one way is you have a single tool that does a whole bunch of things. And the second way is you have multiple tools that are a lot like Lego that you can block on very easily. I listen to music when I drive in the car and the music usually comes from my phone, but I am not looking to buy from an Acura or a Ford or a Toyota. I'm looking at a separate set of vendors for that. So. The reason is the ability, they have become like building blocks and you can very easily plug it into each other. So the complexity is definitely something you have to keep in mind. And if I depend on a Ford or a Toyota or a Honda to innovate on the phone business, it's a much harder problem. I'll have a clunky brick that's not going to be super innovative. So it's a combination. Complexity is definitely an important issue interoperability and connecting to the different tools in the ecosystem uh, is another way to uh, to solve it. Uh, so that's something the buyer should look at. Yeah, and, and just to add on the previous points there, I do think, yes, I mean, we also got to think about the tools that customers potentially have at their arsenal today, right? I mean, there's going to be some out of the box monitoring uh, platforms that are out there, but yeah, it's going to be up to the the user the you know the support staff to correlate all this information so yes i mean is there a platform that does everything you know i think um you know that's i think what we're all here you know trying to solve right 
But I do think that having a single pane of glass, I think it's you know important for folks so that way it's it's reducing time whenever th you stuff the uh, you know does troubleshoot or fail. And uh, you know, really making it easy and making a purpose-built platform that's you know really specific for the data teams that are on this call today. So let's bring this down a level uh, into the real world. Uh, I was wondering if each of you could describe a customer or an organization that has implemented data observability and, and had some positive results. One story that comes to mind is uh, we're working with uh, UBS, which is a large financial organization. They made a very heavy investment into the Databricks platform. And, you know, at their scale, they have thousands of users, tens to hundreds of thousands of um, data apps that they're running per day, and they're facing multitudes of challenges. Uh, since Databricks was, uh, you know, very hot service for, for these folks, they were bringing in, uh, there was a lot of new users that were coming in, but they were also faced with uh, the ability for just understanding where cost is going. And you know, they pretty soon they were they were facing some very significant cost overruns uh, to the point where they started bringing in some professional services to come in and really help fix that problem. But the challenge with that is that you know that's a very very reactive state. Being able to just you know continue to manually try to address these things, you're never going to get out of that that state, right? So uh, they did bring in Unravel, and so some of the things that we were able to bring in is just overall where are all your the, the bad. Um, behavior. Where are all the bad pipelines? You know, wh why are things failing? What are some of the things that we can do to address it? We were able to do this at a scale from an automated fashion, right? So, not doing these things, you know, very reactively, but looking at it at all the jobs that are being submitted. Really, essentially picking like the top ten, the fifteen, the ones that were really um, providing the most uh, significant uh, resource overruns. You know, in terms of just overall, just forecasting, it was a, a crapshoot, so to speak, for folks to really just try to understand, you know, how are things trending? Because yes, we do need to be mindful of cost. And, you know, how do we do that if the users are consuming up resources in an erratic fashion, right? So having an observability platform that's looking at just things uh, overall, but then also providing some ways to help optimize that, you know, really helped in terms of forecasting so the the organization itself can really understand what the, what how are true costs trending and, and you know really have a handle on you know where things are going from that standpoint but the biggest thing is i think is having some observability at the uh, at the job level for the users right and so with the folks that were coming in brand new bringing in some of their their data pipelines maybe not having the best practices because they were new to the environment itself Having some um, insight in there to actually provide this, you know, just across the board really helped have those conversations with the folks that might not have been uh, um, doing the best practices or maybe, you know, uh, giving them a better reason as to why some of their pipelines continue to fail, you know, really upskilled them, right, to make sure that they're being better data uh, stewards, I guess. But, uh, but most importantly, you know, just getting out of this reactive fashion and just being a little bit more predictable about, you know, how the job should be running, have a little bit more... And you know, most of their jobs hitting uh, more of the SLAs and ultimately just improving the overall experience for the customers all through just having a, an observability platform. Hey, when we, we work with an extremely large fintech company, you know, they serve about 350 million daily active users. And this year they're on the way to processing about a trillion dollars, you know, on their platform and in low value peer to peer transaction. And, you know, for the last three years, we've been working with them monitoring end-to-end -end their OLTP, which is the transactional systems, the OLAP, which is the reporting systems, their machine learning systems, and their streaming systems together. And, you know, in addition to just giving them exceptional SLAs and SLOs, we've also managed the entire data quality that gets through the entire supply chain of data. And, you know, just imagine the scale. If you were down and out for like an hour, it would basically cost you about $100 billion of transaction at their scale. And in the last 24 months, they've not had a single S1 incident across their infrastructure or across their data layer or in their business pipelines. So I think, you know, there are many benefits. There are other use cases that we can talk through as, as we go down, but you know, I don't want to hold this conversation. Yeah. So, far. Well, uh, so the question was uh, successful data observability programs at our customers. A couple come to mind. The one that's high on my radar is a retail customer. They have uh, hundreds of thousands of IoT devices and they process huge volumes of data. Uh, global presence, uh, over 100 
plus countries, high volume of data constantly streaming in. On a weekly basis, they would have data issues, something like 80,000 to 100,000 alerts uh, that something was wrong somewhere. That's a pretty massive number of alerts to be dealing with. And yeah, at some point you got to say, okay, I got to stop the pipeline or something is okay or not okay. And that has serious implications. They brought us in, uh, they implemented data buck and out of the box using our ML algorithms, data buck was able to immediately point out differences between false alerts and, and actual alerts that they should be looking at. Uh, with over a hundred thousand alerts a week, it becomes very hard for the team even to focus their attention on. And the real alerts actually costed them a significant chunk of change. You multiply that by 100,000, that adds up very, very fast. So the thing that made them successful was twofold. One was not wait till the point of consumption to validate, observe, validate the data. So they moved that upstream. And the second thing that made them, help them a lot, reduce their risk and their cost was to be able to automate a big chunk of the observability using machine learning. So a uh, huge reduction. They were able to cut down their cost by over 50% and the alerts uh, to true alerts. So therefore the alerts went down by over 80 to 90% was cut down by catching it. Excellent. Down. Uh, that's a great story. Uh, Josh? When I hear this question, I think about not just the great things that data band delivers to our clients through the outcomes, but I'm thinking about the patterns that we see across really successful clients that do an exceptional job in implementing and getting value from our solution. And, and probably I would apply this to other data observability services as well. And I'm thinking about in particular, one company that we work with, which is a very high growth scale up. It's a, a exceptionally advanced data engineering and machine learning engineering team. They work in the CPG retail space and uh, build computer vision models to help detect uh, images on shelves of retail stores for different kinds of analysis. But um, I think about this company in the view of what are the, the patterns and ingredients that led to their success. And we, we saw a great outcome in deploying to this organization where eventually we, we had a direct line of sight of how we were actually increasing the revenue of this business by helping them deploy more models. But, the, the patterns that I see there and, and could probably apply across our other clients is, first of all, we deliver to the data engineering team, right? That is the core unit within the company that we're working in. And what I see as commonly successful is that unit understands their role as service providers to data consumers and to the business. So in data engineering, this team already, when evaluating data band, they had mapped the needs of the scientists and the analysts and understood what blocks them from being productive in terms of the data that they need. So they already had a good reading on what are the critical issues that are preventing good flow of data to the business. The second pattern there was they understood, this data engineering team understood how their work directly tied to the outcome of their business. So for them, as an ML intensive org, they knew the more models they create, that leads to more clients they can support, and therefore more revenue that their overall business makes. So our objectives quickly became, how do we help them create more models, right? How do we help more models get to the field? And that was a, a really key KPI that this team used to measure their success with our platform. And then the third, uh, I think third characteristic of, of this team and, and a, a pattern is they had very clearly defined SLAs for their data product, in their case being machine learning. For them, they needed contractually to provide something like 95% accuracy on their machine learning models that their data pipelines then needed to support. So there's always that line of sight of how well are we doing in the data engineering team to meet the SLA and to deliver to the business. And I think those are uh, patterns that we would want to see repeated across different clients, and hopefully we can coach folks to, to get there as well. Kevin, Laura, do you have any questions for the panel? So I'd love to uh, follow up on... A I thought insightful comment from Rohit in particular about the um, those poor data engineers, and I'm sure we have heads of data engineering teams on the call here, but that role I think is, is going to be charged with implementing a lot of these data observability programs. And I, I think the, the burden that's being put on uh, by the business to manage data delivery, to handle this explosion in data supply and demand is challenging. I'm just curious, 
as organizations are taking your solutions and putting them to work, what techniques are they using to make sure that the data observability program doesn't overwhelm? Um, ease of use is obviously critical here, but in the end, in a lot of cases, you're increasing workloads and job descriptions. If you think of it, Kevin, you know, when, when we first did, you know, our webinar about two and a half years back, you know, my suggestions were very simple. I don't think, you know, anybody will remember that. But, you know, we had a few suggestions that, you know, what is your surface area really? And where are you experiencing most of the pain? I think that continues to be the guiding principle as to where people start implementing. And, you know, it also goes and ties into where you are in, in terms of your data journey, because a lot of customers are still dealing with, you know, structured, unstructured, log kind of data and, and with very expensive data compute and data processing uh, systems. I think uh, if you just took a step back and to my earlier comments, the way that I've really started to contextualize this is that, you know, today data leaders are tasked with three different objectives. One, which is owning the technology, second, owning the team, and finally, you know, delivering data to the business. And these are like all individual areas, you know, hiring, retaining talent is very, very hard, you know, and so is the selection of technology in this, you know, you know the optionality that exists for people to go and do the same thing in 20 different ways. So the typical thing that you would want to do is to basically certify or to establish a platform or a practice in which, you know, some core pieces have to exist for a long time and the rest should be either fungible or replaceable with little or no effort. And those would essentially be between, you know, options of SQL versus, you know, several dashboarding tools to programmatic interactions with data. I think those three patterns are very, very difficult to break. You will have programmatic interaction, you'll have SQL, you'll probably have a lot of ingestion. The key is that, you know, can you monitor this entire pipeline? Can you look through, um, you know, through a single pane of glass and can you find out that, you know, I'm getting visibility into what is coming into my data system or data ecosystem, what is acting on it, you know, through transmissions and who's consuming it and are they happy with that consumption pattern? I think that would be the bare minimum that I would basically uh, look at uh, from an observability standpoint. Otherwise, you know, it, it again puts the burden back on somewhere else that, you know, yes, I did put a brace on my knee, but, you know, my ankle started hurting because, you know, I was just supporting the ankle. So I think there has to be like some measure of sort of equality and parity in, in considering, you know, who are we helping and who are we hurting. Great, we're getting a lot of good questions from the audience. Uh, so I want to insert one here and then uh, we might have time for one more question after that. So this is from Jeff from uh, ADP. It seems that a lot of the conversation around tools is geared towards more structured data. How are these tools incorporating unstructured data, if at all? Uh, we have petabytes of unstructured data and this discovery and usability is paramount to the overall picture. Let me take that question up. I think, you know, any organization today will have to deal with, you know, structured and unstructured data together. You know, when we speak with, let's say, a Blue Cross Blue Shield, you know, they have like mainframes on the left and, you know, Azure Synapse on the right and everything in between. Somebody bought it, put it in production. And, you know, th these technologies are not going to go away. I mean, the lack of structure is what is putting so much pressure on these data systems, data leaders and the unpredictability that exists. And is it going to go away? No, it is not. Because, you know, data exchanges are going to happen through different systems, different kinds of companies, and it's not actually going to reduce at any point in time. So one of the fundamental things that we did, and, you know, I know we are a little short in time, we actually said that, you know, what are the different kinds of data sources? You know, there's basically data in streams, and therefore they have to be, you know, observed in streams, you have to observe files when they land, you know, and that includes, you know, files, tables, you know, different kinds of formats. If you are actually a data provider, which is, let's say that you were somebody like a Dun & Bradstreet, you're actually taking data from 140 different markets. So you can't expect all of that data to come in one format to you. So it's basically GSRL version one, all the way to GSM version seven. And in that, you know, there's no structure. So you're basically harmonizing all of that data and trying to create a structure so that your eventual consumption would work. And I think the opportunity lies there that you have to shift left your entire thinking in terms of how you make your data and analytics systems much more efficient. So I think, you know, the best tools, they actually cater to the unstructured data lakes as well. 
And you know, we are very comfortable with 100 petabyte data lake today. We, we are able to you know, process and give insights at the level and value that we should. Great. Well, listen, uh, we have time for one more question. This is going to be a speed round, so I'm going to call on each of you. And the question is simple. In, in 30 seconds or so, what is your product's biggest differentiator in the marketplace? And let's start with uh, Chris. Sure. All right. So, you know, here at Unravel, you know, we look at things a little bit differently. Uh, rather than categorizing observability solutions into vertical buckets, we think uh, about what answers different teams need to their questions at various stages of their workflows, specifically in our case, the data ops lifecycle. We found that such data ops observability cuts across four flavors, clearly deep visibility into how the different applications are interdependent on one another in a data pipeline is a core component of data ops observability, but so is the ability to control the cost of these applications in a cloud environment and be able to understand how miss SLAs or performance issues uh, impact company revenue. The best of traditional APM observability tools do this well for web apps, but data apps are a completely different animal with different competing paradigms uh, different classes of problems that have different types of causes and different remediation. Unravel has that depth of granular details horizontally across all components in the modern data stack, as well as vertically from application to infrastructure and everything in between. That allows us to have that full picture so we can apply uh, AI to get those crisp and prescriptive recommendations on exactly where and how to optimize for performance and cost, identify root causes automatically assess workloads for cloud migration, uh, et cetera. So it's not just data observability or data pipeline observability, it's a little bit of application observability and a little bit of IT operations observability. So you're vertically spanning the markets. Okay. Yep. Josh, you're up next. So I think from business level, what makes us feel a little different is we have this maniacal focus on improving time to detection of data incidents and time to resolution of incidents. It's a very operationally oriented focus within our system. And that'll feel different compared to other services in our space in data observability, which might lean more towards analyst users or data science users downstream. We have this very, very tight focus on the, the core data engineering and platform team. And what makes us feel different underneath that focus on a product level is a few things. First of all, there's a balance of metadata that we capture, which is informed by the needs of those central data ops teams. So this is pipeline performance information, it's data quality information, it's lineage information. There's a, a balance of information we're collecting based on the things that drive the SLAs within those teams. Second thing is we have open integrations that we use to enrich the metadata that we capture and that we use to integrate the, just the core pipeline services and try to cover the most important areas of the tech stack within those, those data teams. And then the third area is how we aim to surface alerts in ways that fit the needs of that operations unit. So trying to get incidents detected as soon as they actually occur within the pipeline in the ingestion stage, in the lake stage, in the warehouse stage, we're trying to detect these incidents in real time rather than look retroactively at data as it's sitting in these databases, which might be too late in the flow and okay. you know, already be affecting them. All right, Seth, we you literally have 30 seconds, so please be concise here, and then we're gonna finish with Bruno. Sure. So how are we, what's different about our product? Yeah. DataBuck is a unified metadata and data observability tool for any location in your pipeline. It is autonomous, uses machine learning to quantify data trustability, starting from the lake, through the pipelines, to the warehouse, to the point of consumption. It reduces risk and cost simultaneously for getting good trustable data. It is completely open API designed, and it enables self-service for the business user to see how to get trustable data themselves without depending on IT. Excellent. All right, Rohit, you get the last word in, in really 30 seconds. <laughs> Your word of domination, Wayne. That's our differentiation. Right? We do all of that. <laughs> that wow. everybody says. No, we've taken a platform approach and uh, we, you know, we serve all different layers. I think one of the unique things about Excel Data is that you don't have to look for another tool if you've implemented it. And we've built a lot of IP around, you know, identifying issues in your infrastructure, identifying issues of your cloud costs, 
making sure your resources are optimized when you're on premise or on private cloud. And finally, that your business processes work really well. So end to end solution. All right. Well, I'd love to thank our panelists, Josh, Seth, Chris, and Rohit. Thank you for all your insights. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the main tent session. And we're here along with you to discuss what we learned. What are our key takeaways from this event? Um, let me turn to Kevin and, and Laura to find out what their key takeaways are. Laura, why don't you go first? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So one of the things that struck me, I was thinking about it from our session. We got a question about how do you set standards or data quality requirements so that you can actually find bad data you know, using these observability tools? And I think that's a legitimate question, but I also think because of the way these tools work and the opportunity they give you to see what your data looks like and how it behaves, that they can become a means by which you can determine what quality levels you, you expect and how you need your data to behave. So they provide some of the context that's necessary to set standards and to set a policy around data quality requirements. And they do it in a way similar to profiling tools just by showing you the data. But I think because they give you the, a very wide breadth, you know, you could leverage them quickly to get there. So that's one of them. Yeah, I like that. We're seeing that with a lot of ML type tooling is that they do a lot of heavy lifting and scouring through, you know, large volumes of data to kind of tease out what's important. And then you as the human can go and, you know, you're, you're more focused in the right direction and you can go uh, be more productive, or in this case, you know, you can write better standards and policies because the tool did all the heavy lifting. Yeah, and that kind of gives me a, a follow-up as well, which comes back to some of the remarks that I was making in the beginning, which is, you know, when you adopt tools like this, you need a plan and a methodology for actually using the results because they'll provide an amazing amount of data, but it can be overwhelming. So again, understanding how the tools themselves find anomalies, how they work, and then applying that knowledge so that you can bring focus to how you want to get value from them. You know, we've been in this space in technology for 30 some odd years, at least I have. And, you know, you, you always see business people trying to put the tool in front of the horse, so to speak. And <laughs> you really need a plan and methodology. You need to focus on uh, people in the process. In fact, that's what I would say, listening to Kevin, you know, if you don't have your people and processes in place, the tools won't do much good. Would you agree with that statement, Kevin? Uh, definitely. And I think uh, Laura would align with that too. <laughs> it's interesting. One of the things along those lines is that there's a real focus on the vendor panel on FinOps, on the cost, on monitoring and optimizing cost, which certainly aligns with the cost of data delivery. That certainly aligns with uh, findings we've had overall with cloud adoption. Organizations are moving to the cloud. Cost and efficiency is one of those things, but they, you need to keep a close eye on how you're using compute in particular. So cost monitoring and optimization is a big part of, of data observability on the pipeline side. Do you say that's one of the top use cases? Yeah, I'd say it is. And uh, you know, another point is that we're definitely hearing organizations want to move the, or should put the, the control point upstream, as far upstream as possible in order to prevent issues from reaching customers. So the more you move close to the source of the data in your monitoring, the more you can remediate faster. And so that's definitely a strategy as organizations put these tools into place. Control point, you mean point the data observability tool that's close to the source data as possible, right? Exactly, yeah. And, and you know, different tools, some will do a data in flight, some will do data at rest, but the more you can do it before it hits the customer, the better. And that, uh, yeah. again, goes back to sort of data quality fundamentals, right? That preventing issues is the best way to reduce costs and especially downstream costs. And if you the tools allow you to see the data, they allow you to understand where those control points would be, and they may even allow you to eliminate the root causes of some of the problems.
the real root causes, the process causes. I assume with these tools, you can cycle through your errors a lot more. You can catch more and learn faster. And therefore, instead of catching them, you'll be fixing them and they won't happen again. You have to be, when it comes to data, sort of be ambitious in scope, but incremental in deployment. Although some of the vendors, they were saying, you know, you're only focusing on the in incremental part, right? Don't boil the ocean. I think Josh was saying that, right? Because if you try to boil the ocean, you probably won't get much done. Yeah, there was definitely a takeaway that you do want to be very, very specific at the problems you solve. I think that if you differentiate between a project, which is specific, and an initiative, which can be strategic, longer range, and really have some uh, hairy, audacious goals, that's the key. You need both sides. Yeah. All right. Just to, uh, to follow up on what you both were saying about managing scope and bringing focus. One of the things that I really appreciated about the vendor panel was that all four were talking about the fact that you need to know what problems you want to solve within your organization before, you know, just applying these tools. I think that's critical to success in all aspects of data management. If you know where your pain points are, or if you know where your opportunities are, taking either a negative or a positive starting point, you can solve your own problems, but you have to be systematic about how you approach them. I think the inevitable question you had, Wayne, uh, was how do you avoid the complexity of managing multiple tools? Um, Seth had, a, I think, a, a good analogy, which I personally like because I'm a Lego fan and I also use for technology. <laughs> You want to maintain Lego-like interoperability from between the pieces of your environment. Mm -hmm. As long as you have open API access and open interoperability, you can have multiple elements in your environment. You got to make sure you have it though. Commercial and open source products, you got to make sure they work together. Uh, and that gets to that first discussion we had in the panel about how many data observability products do you need? Yeah. And I forget which panel was making the argument that they all solve a very specific problem. So you basically, basically insinuate you might need multiple data observability tools, which was interesting. That, that got some reaction from the audience. Um, one question came in, well, how do you manage the interoperability among all those tools and what about the cost? But do you guys buy into that, that you're going to need, if you're a big organization with lots of different things you need to stay on top of, you're going to need multiple tools? To some degree, but I think it's going to be a very interesting and different conversation one to two years from now, because there's inevitably a convergence. There's M&A, IBM just bought DataBand. There'll probably be some more of that. But also, there's a strong argument that observability should be an element of a catalog or a fabric. Yes, you need a best of breed pure play solution for some specific problems, but there's some good enough approaches where if this is a feature of a data fabric, okay, you can solve some of your problems there. So I think there will be inevitable convergence. Wayne, you've observed, I think, in some other segments that all good things converge in tech. And uh, <laughs> if I've quoted you accurately, I would wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> I want to thank everyone in the audience for participating in this event and helping us iron out some of the nuances of using this new platform. I hope you liked it. We'd love to hear your feedback. If you could care to take a minute and send us an email. Info at Eckerson.com or Wayne at Eckerson.com would be suitable. I want to thank all of you for participating in this first of a kind event, focusing on this emerging field of data observability. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.